Namasté. Nous faisons partie du groupe de dévotis de Paris. Et nous allons vous lire la rencontre de Henri Le Sceau avec Bhagavan, que vous pouvez retrouver dans Face to Face with Sri Ramana Maharshi. Namasté. We are in the group of Paris devotees. We shall read the account of Father Henri Le Sceau's meeting with Ramana Maharshi which you can find in Face to Face with Sri Ramana Maharshi. Plus tôt dans sa vie, Swami Abhishekthananda était le père Henri Le Sceau, un moine chrétien qui pensait que des prêtres chrétiens pouvaient être acceptés en Inde en tant que sannyasin. Il étudia les textes sacrés hindous et s'essaya aux pratiques de dévotion et de méditation qu'il recommandait. Il écrivit entre autres le secret d'Arunachala. Swami Abhishekananda, earlier in his life, was a Christian monk called Father Henri Le Sceau, who felt that Christian priests, as sannyasin, would find acceptance in India. He studied Hindu scriptures and experimented with the devotional and meditational practices they recommend. He authored, among other works, The Secret of Our Natural Le frère Jules Monchanin, qui était un dévotis de Sri Ramana et moi-même, sommes entrés dans le hall, avons salué le marché avec respect, et nous nous sommes assis dans la foule. Je me concentrais pour regarder avec attention le marché au sujet de qui j'avais tant lu et ai entendu tant de choses. Toutefois, malgré mon attente fervente, ou plutôt peut-être à cause de celle-ci, je me sentis abandonné. Et tout à ma déception, je sentis la tristesse emplir mon cœur. Je continuais à regarder intensément le marché. Sri Ramana's devotee, Father Montanin, and I entered the hall, saluted Maharshi respectfully, and sat among the crowd. I concentrated on looking with attention at the Maharshi, of whom I had read and heard so much. However, Despite my fervent expectation, or perhaps rather because of it, I felt let down, and in my disappointment, sadness filled my heart. I continued to stare intently at the Maharshi. À 11 heures, le gong résonna pour le repas. Suivant le Maharshi, nous nous sommes tous dirigés vers la salle à manger. Comme c'était notre premier repas, je Jean, Jules Manchanin et moi-même eurent le privilège d'être assis exactement en face du marché. Durant tout le temps que je mangeais, mes yeux quittaient très peu le marché, tellement je désirais découvrir son secret. Il était assis par terre, comme nous tous, mangeait avec ses doigts sur une feuille de plantain, comme nous, et avait exactement la même nourriture que nous. C'était un principe qu'il appliquait de façon inflexible. Depuis le début de son assaise, il avait toujours refusé avec véhémence de toucher quoi que ce soit qui ne pouvait pas être partagé librement avec tout le monde. Une fois de plus, et sans aucun doute, je pouvais voir en lui un excellent grand-père, Mélora. En vain, je forçais mes yeux à l'apercevoir, mais tous mes efforts étaient inutiles. At eleven o'clock, the gong sounded for the meal. Following the Maharshi, we all made our way to the dining hall. Father Manoshen and I, as this was our first meal, had the privilege of being seated exactly in front of the Maharshi. All the time I was eating, my eyes scarcely left the Maharshi. So eager was I to discover his secret. He was sitting on the floor just like us, ate with his fingers, as we did, from a plantain leaf, and had exactly the same food as ours. This was a principle that he maintained inflexibly. Since the beginning of his tapas, he had always vehemently refused to touch anything that could not be shared freely with all in sundry. Once again, and without doubt, I could see him as an excellent grandfather, but the halo, in vain I strained my eyes trying to see it, All my efforts were useless. Après le déjeuner, Jules Monchanin m'emmena rencontrer Ethel Merson, 
qu'il avait rencontrée lors d'une visite précédente. Elle me demanda quelles étaient mes impressions. Et comme je ne souhaitais pas dissimuler la vérité, je lui parlai de ma déception. Elle me dit « Vous êtes venu ici avec bien trop de bagages. Vous voulez savoir, vous voulez comprendre. » Vous insistez pour que ce qui vous est destiné vous parvienne par le chemin que vous avez déterminé. Au lieu de cela, vous devriez vous rendre vide et réceptif. After the midday meal, Reverend Munchinen took me to meet Ethel Marston, whom he had met on a previous visit. She asked him my impressions, and as I did not wish to conceal the truth, I told her of my disappointment. She said, You come here with far too much baggage. You want to know. You want to understand. You're insisting that what is intended for you should come to you by the path which you have determined. Instead, you should make yourself empty and be receptive. Quand les Veda reprirent, leurs forces me transportèrent beaucoup plus loin des choses et de moi-même que cela avait été le cas la veille. La fièvre. Ma torpeur, un état de demi-rêve, tout cela semblait ouvrir en moi des états de conscience dans lesquels tout ce que je voyais ou entendais éveillait en profondeur des échos qui me submergeaient puissamment. Même avant que mon esprit ne puisse reconnaître la chose et encore moins l'exprimer, l'aura invisible du sage avait été perçue par quelque chose en moi de plus profond que n'importe quel mot. Des harmonies inconnues s'éveillaient dans mon cœur. C'était comme si l'âme même de l'Inde pénétrait les profondeurs mêmes de ma propre âme et communiait avec elle de façon mystérieuse. C'était un appel qui transperçait tout et ouvrait un puissant abîme. When the Vedas began again, the spell carried me off much further from things and from myself than had been the case on the previous evening. The fever, my sleepiness, a condition that was half dreaming, seemed to release in me zones of para-consciousness in which all that I saw or heard aroused overwhelmingly powerful echoes. Even before my mind was able to recognize the fact, and still less express it, the invisible halo of the sage had been perceived by something in me deeper than any words. Unknown harmonies awoke in my heart. In the sage of Aranachala, I had discerned the unique sage of the eternal India, the unbroken succession of her sages. It was as if the very soul of India penetrated to the very depths of my own soul and held mysterious communion with it. It was a call that pierced through everything and opened a mighty abyss. À la fin de la soirée, je savais que je devrais partir. La fièvre empirait. Le lendemain matin, je tombai tout simplement dans mon lit et j'y suis resté trois jours, incapable de bouger. Mais si le corps était là, étiré sous les draps, l'esprit était toujours dans l'ashram de Sri Ramana. Les chants des Védas tels que je les avais entendus là continuaient à résonner à mes oreilles. Devant mes yeux dansait toujours l'image du vieil homme étendu sur son divan et de la foule autour de lui qui le pressait avec dévotion. Dans mes rêves fiévreux, quand je n'étais ni pleinement éveillé, ni pleinement endormi, c'était le marché qui m'apparaissait de façon intense. Quand je revins à moi, après ces jours de fièvre, je pris conscience de la profondeur en moi-même où avait pénétré cette première rencontre avec Sri Ramana. By evening, I knew that I had to leave. The fever was getting worse. Next morning, I simply fell into bed and stayed there for three days, unable to move. But if the body was there, stretched out under the bedclothes, the spirit was still in Sri Ramana's ashram. The Vedic chants, as I had heard them there, still continued to sound in my ears. Before my eyes still danced the picture of the old man, 
<clears throat> stretched out on his couch, and with the crowd pressing devotedly around him. In my feverish dreams, when I was neither fully awake nor fully asleep, it was the Maharshi who unremittingly appeared to me. When I came to myself again after those days of fever, I realized to what a depth in myself this first meeting with Sri Ramana had penetrated. Bhagavan's economy, Viswanatha Swami, you should be capable of making use of even the dust, while at the same time you should also be ready to reject the entire cosmos as mere dust. These were the potent words given by Bhagavan to me. When we were together cutting vegetables, Bhagavan was keen on using every bit of vegetables for cooking. Usually, the stem portion of a brinjal is cut off and thrown away. Bhagavan would gather these rejects and utilize them in some other preparation. He would say that, that the stem portion is most nutritious. He would use the whole spinach, stem and all and not just the green leaves alone. He would grind the stems, take out the juice and use it in rasam. Bhagavan frowned on wastage. Like vegetables, pepper too was to be used with the utmost care and economy. Every bit of pepper would be preserved by him. He would bind them into small notebooks according to their size. He himself would bind them, keeping with him gum, calico, needle and twine for this purpose. And he would use these materials only when and to the extent they were required. His day-to-day -day life was by itself a great lesson for every one of us. He taught by example economy and non-waste, not only of materials, but of words too, both spoken and written. How much he said in so few words. On another occasion, Kunju Swami said, the way Bhagavan used spinach, green leaves, in the kitchen is a lesson in passions, economy, and in the culinary art. Heaps of spinach would be gathered in the kitchen. Early morning, Bhagavan would go there. We would follow. His instructions for cutting were specific. His method. The spinach should be cut into three parts. First the stalk, the leaves, second the stem, and then the root. The leaves are used for making curry. The stems are bundled and tied together and put into the boiling sambar. The roots are thoroughly cleaned a number of times in water and then crushed three or four times on the stone, each time taking the juice out until only pure fiber is left. This juice is mixed with the rasam. This is the routine for cooking spinach. This means so much work and Bhagavan did it mostly himself. Once there was a huge bundle of spinach, we did not want to trouble Bhagavan who would be very particular in making use of the roots as well. So we took all the roots, bundled them up and buried them underground in a place near the cow shed which Bhagavan did not frequent while going for his walk. Strangely, on that day, Bhagavan did deviate from his usual route and passed by that very spot. Since the earth was freshly disturbed, Bhagavan just put his walking stick into it and some spinach roots surfaced. Bhagavan immediately saw through. He sat down and dug out all the roots himself 
and washed them thoroughly. Since the roots were all now covered with mud, it took him long to clean them all. He then went to the kitchen, crushed them repeatedly till all the juice was taken out. He himself put the juice into the rasam and only then continued his walk. Bhagavan did all this with a smile on his face, without a trace of irritation or anger. He never asked as to who did it. It was an object lesson for us all who silently witnessed this with untold guilt feeling. This lesson was imprinted in our hearts that day so deeply that never afterwards did we think of idling or wasting anything. Bhagavan was opposed to any sort of waste or extravagance. How do you light the fire in your charcoal stove? He asked me one day. I told him that I used a bit of old rag rolled up and dipped in kerosene. Smilingly, he scolded me for wasting kerosene when the fire could easily be lit with some of the dry twigs and leaves lying around or with bits of waste paper. Ariyadi idara sivarad agavari sakkugayil arivairami paramatuman arunachala ramanan parivalvulam uruganala paranarndidu kugayarndu Arivam vili tiravanisam arivayad veliyam. An interesting story lies as the backdrop of this verse. While Bhagavan was residing at Virupakshaka, a Kerlite by name Amritananda Yatindrad wrote a verse in Malayalam on a piece of paper and left it on Bhagavan's seat as Bhagavan had gone out. The gist of the verse is as follows. Is Bhagavan Rishi Ramana the ocean of compassion, dwelling in the famous cave on the peak of Arunachala, the celebrated Vishnu, or Muruga, the teacher of Lord Siva, or Varavushi, the Siva Yogi? Or is he Sage Vyasa? Who is this Arunachala Ramana? My heart is filled with anticipation and joy to know the greatness of the Guru. When Bhagavan returned and saw the paper with the verse written on it, he bestowed a reply in the same meter in Malayalam on the other side of the paper. Later on, Bhagavan himself graciously translated it into Tamil. Natananda records that Bhagavan very often used to say, Who ever sees me with the same eyes as mine and the way I see myself is the one who has had my dashan truly. Bhagavan, true, an ardent devotee, Amritananda Yatindra. Thus, choose to announce his transcendent form to the world of devotees, who like limiting themselves to their bodies, constrict, constrict the Lord of Grace to a body and offer worship to him. This is reminiscent of the way Lord Krishna Cho Arjuna instructed mankind in days of yore the form of him. Thus, I am the Self, O Gudakesa, dwelling in the hearts of all beings, as the indweller of every jiva, never away for a moment, ever revealing as bliss in Arunachala Ramana. The ever unchanging state is that state of being alone, the form of wisdom, that the self is.
is verily a notion of peace. The subtle height of wisdom opens when with an inward turn mind is coupled with heart melting devotion. Only an eye of wisdom can perceive it. Its real form is the supreme expanse of consciousness. Om Namo Bhagavate Sri Ramanaya Muktakatraya, Three Verses on Liberation The Muktakatraya, Three Verses on Liberation, are Sanskrit compositions written by Sri Bhagavan on separate occasions. They were later collected together. The Muktakatraya are the introductory verses to the Sanskrit Parayana chanted at Sri Bhagavan's Samadhi on Sunday mornings. The other Sanskrit verses Sri Bhagavan composed are Upadesha Saram and Arunachala Pancharatnam. The first of the three verses from Muktakatraya begins with Ekam Aksharam. The story behind this composition goes like this. In September 1937, a devotee called Soma Sundara Swami came to Sri Bhagavan with a new notebook and requested that Sri Bhagavan write one letter. Sri Bhagavan replied with a two-line poem in Tamil, which he later translated into Sanskrit. It goes like this. Ekam aksharam ridinirantaram pasate swayam likhyate katam. In English, it means the one imperishable letter or syllable itself shines on its own continually in the heart. How is it to be written? The second of the three verses begins with Hridaya Kuharamadye. One day in 1915, when Sri Bhagavan was at Skandashramam, a young devotee called Jagadisha Shastri wrote on a piece of paper Hridaya Kuharamadye in the interior of the heart cave, but he could go no further. In an account written by the devotee B. V. Narasimhaswami, Sri Bhagavan saw this and asked Jagadisha Shastri what he was writing. Shastri handed the verse over to Bhagavan, who said, Go on, complete the verse. Shastri replied that he was unable to do this. His mind refused to work. Sri Bhagavan took up the verse and completed it himself. There is another version of the story where the Shastri goes away and for a short time, and when he comes back to his surprise, he finds that the verse was completed by Bhagavan himself. The completed verse was later sent to Sri Kavya Kanta Ganapati Muni, who incorporated it in his Sri Ramana Gita, chapter 2, verse 2. The verse goes like this. Hridaya kuhara madhye kevalam brahma matram yahamahamiti sakshat atma rupe nabhati ridivisha manasasvam chinvata majjatava bhavana chalana rodhat atma nishto bhavatvam The English meaning is in the innermost core of the heart cave, there shines alone pure Brahman, directly as I, I, the self-aware. Enter deep into the heart by means of self-inquiry, or by diving deep, or by controlling the breath, thus abide firmly in Atman, the self. Verse 3, the last verse of Muktakatraya, was written in 1927. It was one of the few verses written spontaneously by Sri Bhagavan, unrequested by any particular devotee. It was later translated into Tamil and included as verse number 10 of Uladhanarpada Anubandha, the appendix to the 40 verses on reality. The verse goes like this. Deham rinmaya vajjardatma kamaham 
Buddhirnatasyasyato Naham tadhabheda supti samaye Sid atma sad bhavataha Koham bhava yuta kuto varadhiya Drishtvatma nishtatma nam Soham spurti taya runa chala shivaha Purno vibhati svayam The English meaning is this. This body, like a pot of clay, is insentient in nature. Since it has no eye consciousness per se, and since in deep sleep, where there is no awareness of the body, we experience our natural state of being. The body, therefore, cannot be I. To those who are established as the self and who have seen with a sharp intellect adhering to the inquiring, who am I, and from whence, Aruna Chala Shiva shines forth of himself as the manifestation of I am that. Now I'll sing the three verses. Ekamaksharam ridinirantaram pasate swayam likhyate katam ridaya kuhara madye kevalam brahma matram yahamahamiti sakshat atma rupe nabhati ridivisha manasasvam chinvata majjatava bhavana chalana rodat atma nishto bhavatvam deham vrinmaya vajjadatma kamaham buddhir natasyasyato Naham tat adabheda supti samaye sid atma sad bhavataha koham bhava yuta kuto varadiya drishtvatma nishtatmanam soham spurtitaya luna chala shivaha purno vibhati svayam Om namo bhagavate Sri Ramanaya Om Namo Bhagavate Sri Ramanaya We chose this passage from Talks with Ramana Maharshi because it reflects the current situation in the world. Question There are widespread disasters spreading havoc in the world. Famine and pestilence, what is the cause of this state of affairs? Answer. To whom does all this appear? They won't do. I see misery around. You were not aware of the world and its sufferings in your sleep. You are conscious of them in your wakeful state. Continue in that state in which you were not afflicted by these. That is to say, when you are not aware of the world, its suffering do not affect you. When you remain as the self, as in sleep, the world and its sufferings will not affect you. Therefore, look within, see the self. There will be an end of the world and its miseries. But that is selfishness. The world is external. Because you identify yourself wrongly with the body, you see the world outside and its pain becomes apparent to you. But they are not real. Seek the reality and get rid of this unreal feeling. There are great men, public workers, who cannot solve the problem of the misery in the world. They are ego-centered and therefore their inability. If they remained in the self, they would be different. Why do not Mahatmas help? How do you know that they do not help? Public speeches, physical activity and material help are all outweighed by the silence of Mahatmas. They accomplish more than others. What is to be done by us for ameliorating the condition of the world? If you remain free from pain, there will be no pain anywhere. The trouble now is due to your seeing the world externally and also thinking that there is pain there. But both the world and the pain are within you. If you look within, there will be no pain. God is perfect. Why did he create the world so imperfect? 
The work shares the nature of the author, but here it is not so. Who is it that raises the question? I, the individual. Are you apart from God that you ask this question? So long as you consider yourself the body, you see the world as external. The imperfections appear to you. God is perfection. His work also is perfection. But you see it as imperfection because of your wrong identification. Why did the self manifest as this miserable world? In order that you might seek it. Your eyes cannot see themselves. Place a mirror before them and they see themselves. Similarly with the creation. See yourself first and then see the whole world as the self. So it amounts to this, that I should always look within? Yes. Should I not see the world at all? You are not instructed to shut your eyes from the world. You are only to see yourself first and then see the whole world as the self. If you consider yourself as the body, the world appears to be external. If you are the self, the world appears as a Brahman. Question. Le monde est secoué par d'effroyables épreuves, telles que la famine, les épidémies. Quelle est la cause de ces calamités Bhagavan. Dans votre sommeil, vous n'étiez pas conscient du monde et de ses souffrances. À l'état de veille, vous en prenez conscience. Restez dans l'état dans lequel vous n'étiez pas affligé par tout cela. Autrement dit, lorsque vous n'avez pas conscience du monde, vous n'êtes pas affecté par ses souffrances. Quand vous restez le soi, comme dans le sommeil, le monde et ses souffrances ne vous affectent plus. Par conséquent, intériorisez-vous. Voyez le soi. Ce sera la fin de ce monde et de ses misères. On ne vous enseigne pas de fermer vos yeux au monde. Vous devez simplement vous voir vous-même d'abord et voir ensuite le monde comme étant le soi. Si vous pensez être le corps, le monde vous apparaît comme extérieur. Si vous êtes le soi, le monde vous apparaît comme Brahman. Question 